just want to highlight um, what Logan mentioned about uh, the kids. So obviously July and August, we're going to have the kids in here with us, and that is a wonderful thing. Uh, being a parent of four, I know sometimes as a, as a parent, you really want your kids to be, it's really reasonable to be still and quiet and not move or make any distractions. We really don't want that. We want your kids to be your kids and to be able to have fun and enjoy. Now, not too much crazy fun. You know, if, if, if your kids need to run around, that's fun. There's, they're in the back, actually, you can hear the message. If you feel like you need to go, but for the most part, that's not our need. So we just want you to know, and hopefully um, you can feel relaxed this summer um, with your kids in here with you, because we're really glad that you're here and that they're here with you in the service. In that context, in a sense, every life has... Um, has a story, doesn't it? And I wonder when you think about your life, when, when did your story start? I think we might, I might think of my story starting sometime in the 60s, not going to tell you what year, okay? <clears throat> you might think of the year when your story started. But the reality is, is our stories actually start a lot further back, don't they? The people, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and then beyond and beyond and beyond. We are a part, actually, of a much bigger and longer story of which our lives fit into. And, and every story, story, including the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, comes out of a context. Something important came before. Something important comes after. And it's true for all time and all people and all places. And Moses' story comes at a time when we see in the scriptures earlier what Logan read, what we'll see next week and then beyond, where God has chosen a man in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham, through whom he has decided to bless all of the nations and to make a great nation that will bless all of the nations. And God's plan comes in conflict with a different plan, the plan of the Pharaoh who watches this nation become a great nation and say, I don't want that. I'm not interested in that. That's not okay with me. And he's born between the will of Pharaoh and the will of the God who keeps his promises, the covenant-making God. And so our story last week and, and this week and in the future weeks takes place in this clash between God's will, his plan to make a great nation, which includes large, but not just large, but a great nation that reflects him, his attitudes, his perspectives, and has that perspective towards the rest of the world in such a way that they bless the rest of the world and bring them closer to God, that they will bless all the nations. God's plan and Pharaoh's plan. Pharaoh's plan is to diminish this nation, to, to make them small and weak, to take these people away who might be a threat. There is no sense, as Logan mentioned last week, that they are yet a threat, but they might be a threat. And so we need to stop the threat before it happens. Two times already we see in the, in the passage before that Logan did last week that Pharaoh's plan to limit the size of this nation have failed. First, by enslaving the Hebrews, he hoped that they would not have time to procreate and to make new babies, and surprisingly, maybe, amazingly, they were able to continue to grow and multiply and have more children. And then he decided in secret to ask the midwives who were there to help the women as they, the Hebrew women as they have gave birth, if, to say, if it's a boy, throw it out, get rid of it, kill it. If it's a girl, let it live. And these women chose not to participate in that plan. And so we come to a point now where he moves into his third more public way of dealing with this problem, basically saying to all the, the people of Egypt, if you see a Hebrew newborn, a Hebrew boy baby, throw it into the Nile. Get rid of it. Be done with it. You have the authority to kill and it's into this shocking situation, this fear-saturated situation that Moses' parents get married, are pregnant, Moses is born, and for three months they try to keep it secret, keep him quiet. But as anyone who's had kids know, there's only a certain period of time in which they're fairly quiet <laughs> when they cry, which is normal to say, I have needs, help me. And there's a time when their cries become louder and louder and it's impossible 
to stop that. And as the story goes on, we can be, as we know it and have become familiar with it, it's, it's easy maybe for us to miss the horror of, of this passage. But I can think of many of you in this room who have, in the last year or two, had babies. Surprisingly, predominantly, boys. Logan reminds me again and again that it seems like we have to have Old Testament names for all the boys. So you feel free to break that if you want, you know, if you have a boy. Um, but you can imagine, maybe in a way that some of the rest of us cannot, what it would mean to have a child in an environment in which you knew that if your child was a boy, they would be under threat day and night until they were killed. To live as a parent under that pressure, knowing that there's nothing really you could do, that your strength and your power could not stop what seems to be the inescapable, unstoppable power of the Pharaoh. Someone might come and just take your child. And that would be the end of it. We live in difficult times, but we don't live in these kinds of times, do we? We have several different things we're afraid of, but this is thankfully not one of the things that we have to fear. But they did. Some probably believe the message of Pharaoh that these children endanger our nation and therefore they were doing their patriotic duty. Others probably watched and didn't act to save, didn't act to get in the way because they were afraid or they they didn't want to go against the law and so they just let it happen in front of them. Maybe sad that this was necessary. But to be a parent of a newborn boy must have been to live in constant fear and dread of what could happen. Because the reasons they feared were real. The reasons they feared were many and they were ever present from the moment they woke up to the moment they went to sleep. And so it's in this environment where Moses' family, afraid, took that fear and moved it into action, created what is really a desperate gamble, a a plan, a hope that somehow Moses might be saved. Instead of waiting for someone to come and see that he was was a newborn child and grab them away from him and take them down to the Nile and throw them in, they decided to do what they could to make a plan that they hoped would give them the slightest sliver of hope that somehow he might live. And so in desperation, Moses' mother made what is really literally an ark. And if you're thinking of Genesis chapter 6 and Noah, you're right in the right word. An ark. Now, it's not a big ark. It's a really small ark. But it's an ark that's seeking to save a people for the future through Moses. Not an ark of beaver wood, but an ark of, of the reeds and, and pitch around it as you would have had on the ark with a top and a cover. And this ark is then taken and they, they put it in the river but by the side where all the reeds would grow up where hopefully it would not float downstream and where someone could see it. Not knowing what would happen. See, we know the story, right? We know that, hey, it worked out okay. They didn't know. His mother did not know. In fact, she sent her daughter to watch, Moses' brother or sister, to watch. And so she could know what happened. But it's like she couldn't even watch what might happen to her son. What could happen to him? His little basket, his ark could sink. And he could drown. And they could feel like they were somehow culpable in his death. The the ark could be swept downriver, fall over, and he could drown. Someone might come and find it and say, oh, a Hebrew boy, I know what to do with this, and throw him into the river. Or as when I was in Egypt this last year at the uh, Association of International Churches Conference, we were in the Nile and realized that they had created dam and also places further up uh, at the head of the river where the crocodiles could not get through. So most likely, many of these children would have been eaten. They could have thought about 
would something like a crocodile find them? So just horrific thoughts. And yet this seemed to be the best choice, the best possibility, not knowing what was going to happen. Moses' mother acted. Acted in what she felt and believed <clears throat> would be the best interest, the, the most possible best outcome, slim as it may be, that he would live. And she put, her, her daughter put him in the river by the reeds. Speaking of real life, it's really interesting as well that as you read this passage, God never comes up until the, the end of chapter 2. In fact, if you read the chapter before, really God never comes up either. You hear this phrase of God fears, and it probably means more that these people, these midwives knew what was right and wrong. But we, we maybe don't realize, and we were talking about this as a staff team, is that there was not really a whole lot of an awareness of who God is. You know, there is no law. There, there is no deliverance yet of the people. There's no, no, not the miracles and that they have seen to see the power of their God. And so they, they may have heard of this covenant. They may have heard that Abraham, whoever he is, is, his, or is their forefathers, that he had a God that would protect them. But they looked around and go, this is protection. They really didn't know very much as far as we can tell. About God. And so some of the categories that we would think about, how do you know, you should know what to do. You should know that God will be there to help you. No, probably not. It wasn't in their mind. And so you don't see them looking to God necessarily for the most part and, and saying, Lord, help us with this. You see them acting as best they can to care for those around them. But I want you to know this, that even though it doesn't seem like they know God, God knows them. God knows them. And that is the most important part of the story and of the stories to come. Is no matter what they knew and understood and how well they acted out of that knowledge or lack of knowledge, God knew. God was at work as we'll see and as we'll see in the, in the future, God will step up in ways that there's very clear to them and work. But God is at work in this situation. He is helping these people become a great nation. He is thwarting the work of Pharaoh again and again and again. If you read this book, Pharaoh tries and fails. Pharaoh tries and fails. Pharaoh tries and his nation is decimated militarily. God says no. You cannot stop my promises. I will fulfill my commitments to this people, even as they suffer, even as life is lost. It's interesting that Pharaoh's failure comes with an ironic divine twist. It is his own daughter who comes by and sees Moses. The one who said the decree, throw the, throw the boys into the Nile, comes and sees the boy in the Nile <coughs> and takes him out and makes him her own son. I don't want you to catch the irony. I want you to catch the reality that, that he is being undermined by his own daughter in his own family who has a sense of compassion. And that's an important word in this story, an important word for us in our world as we try to do what's right. Compassion moves us to do the right thing because we know what the right thing is to do. But we don't do it because we're afraid instead of compassionate. And she had compassion. And that compassion called her to make this child her own. And so Moses', Moses sister sees the opportunity, seeing what's going on, comes over and asks you, realizing that, that obviously this woman is pulling this child out, this princess, and realizing that there's an opportunity here, seizes that opportunity because the question that will soon come to pass is, who's going to take care of this baby? Who's going to nurse this child? You know, you can't buy formula at, at Cactus, Right? And comes up and comes up with a solution. Do you want me to find someone to take care of this child and to nurse it for you? And the answer really is clearly this one word, go. Go. Which meant go and do it. And she goes to her mother and he says to her mother, brings her mother in. And in a wonderful, wonderful way, she is reunited. Moses is reunited with his mother. 
This is in all the darkness and the bleakness of this passage. This is one of the great moments of hope and joy in the passage. Moses' mother is reunited with her son. Moses is saved, but not just for the day, not just for the moment, but he's brought into a place ultimately of security. His mother is paid to take care of her own son. And Pharaoh's order to kill is undermined by his own daughter who chooses compassion over fear. This is the third time that God has said to Pharaoh, no, no, you don't get your way, Pharaoh. I am going to get my way. And we start to see a sliver of hope that God will rescue. In fact, in a wonderful way, God rescues the rescuer. You see that? Moses is going to be the one who leads them out. And God rescues the one who will rescue or be the one who rescues his people. It's a great story. I just want to highlight a few things. We're going to be talking about the life of Moses. There's lots that's going to come about, lots that we're going to be able to learn about his life and apply to ours. <clears throat> but one, I just have three takeaways for you to think about today. The first is that fear always focuses us on the present moment rather than the bigger, longer-term realities. Fear focuses us. You know, if the bear's chasing you, if you don't run, you won't have to worry about what you want to do tomorrow, right? <laughs> there won't be a tomorrow. And so by nature, fear moves us into that, I have to save myself right now, right now in this place. And that's not always a bad thing. But sometimes when we're in that moment where things are wrong and all messed up, we can't see the bigger picture. We can't realize that, you know what, there is a God who is taking care of us, who is there, who loves us. And the big picture is a picture in Old and New Testament in the book that we have where we can come and get perspective, come and understand the bigger things, that it's not just our own individual lives this moment where God is active, where salvation comes. But that God is at work even in the evil moments and God is at work for the community as a whole to be rescued, not just for me as an individual to be rescued. It's a difficult lesson in this passage because if you take the whole context of what's happening here, God does not always save us in the way that we want or in the time that we want. But God promises to rescue and take forward the community as a whole. And so we tend to be in a time, and I think in many ways, rightly so, a, a change where we, we talk about personal salvation, personally be rescued, and in Jesus, that is certainly the case. But sometimes we lose sight of the fact that God is doing this for community. That it's more than just Jesus and me. It is Jesus and me but it's Jesus and us, and I am a part of that us, that God is ultimately saving, that our salvation is not just personal, but it's community. The second thing is that this Exodus passage really is echoed in Matthew chapter 2 when Jesus comes. And instead of Pharaoh, you have Herod. Instead of Moses, you have Jesus. And in both places, there is great suffering Children are killed because of the evil of people. But in both, God rescues the, re the one who will rescue the people. And so you start to see an echo of the life of Moses and the work of God in the birth of Jesus, that this one will save his people. That God somehow overseen this great arc of salvation, of rescue, of care, and oftentimes, we don't see it. I'm sure many of the people at that time didn't see it. The reality of evil through powerful people is there. It's real. But it's not the end of the story. That's the point. It's not the end of the story. There is much, much more coming. And deliverance and vindication and God's rescue will come. And it will feel late but it will be right on time. It will be more than we hope for, and it will include more than we can imagine. And yes, there will be suffering, but that suffering will be turned to joy and hope 
in the future. That's part of the story. And if you read the Bible very much, it's part of the story again and again and again. And we don't like to embrace it because we don't necessarily like the narrative. We don't want to suffer. But this is the world that we are born into that is not yet the kingdom of God, is not yet the rule of God, but is getting there where God is at work, but evil things happen. And we have to learn how to live in the midst of that as imperfect and broken people. And we're not the first, though. Moses had to live with it. Abraham had to live with it. David had to live with it. The prophets had to live with it. Jesus learned to live with it. The disciples lived with it. The great church fathers lived with it. And mothers lived with it. And so it is now also our time to live in hope, even though everything is not yet the way it should be, the way it will be, to live in hope. We all have moments, and this is the third one, where by every measure that we have, it seems that God is not there. And if you haven't had any of those moments yet, good for you. It's coming. I don't think anybody gets away from that one. Where it just seems like God is not there. Where it seems like he must have forgotten us. Or we have to somehow act without his direction. And yes, we must act, but we can act in faith that even though we don't see and know, and even though we're not sure what God is doing, that somehow he's there. Invisibly working in ways that will help us and others that we may not see soon or even in our lifetime. But one day around his throne, we will rejoice over and say, you were there. And that's what living by faith means, is that we can't see it. We can't see it. And I think in her own way, Moses' mother acted in faith, even though there doesn't seem to be a clear sense that she really understood this covenant-making God who made this great promise of which her son would be an important part. But she acted in faith in the best interest as she understood it from Moses and God worked. I want you to hear this. The plans of evil people will ultimately fail. Ultimately. We will be affected. We will suffer. It will be hard. We will have to endure. Some of us will lose our life as has happened throughout the history of the church and before. But ultimately, their plan, like Pharaoh's, will fail. And God will display his rescue for his people that ultimately brings us and others into that place where we no longer have to worry, where there is no threat and all things are right. They waited a long time to be rescued. But the rescue came. Let us not grow impatient as we wait. Let us hold on to the fact that God was at work even when we can't see it. And that we can look back in the word again and again and again and see that God is at work and people are blind to it. God is at work and we're blind to it. But God is at work rescuing people and his people. And he knows what's happening. And we don't. And so like Moses' mother and like Moses will have to do, let us learn to trust God with what we can't see and have hope about the future. Because God has made promises to make a great nation that will bless the people and he will keep that promise. And you and I are sons and daughters, inheritors and carriers and sharers of that promise. And that's how we are to live. Just as Moses' mother 
put Moses in this situation where she trusted God to work. We put ourselves in the situation where we are givers and sharers and helpers and blessers trusting God to work in them and in us. Do you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, although we often use this story with kids and much of the Old Testament, there are great things for us to learn as children. This is a difficult and serious story that's for adults as well, that shares the realities that we face, but also the hope of the future. The knowledge that you are at work even when we can't see it, maybe especially when we can't see it. And that you have called us to be active and faithful people in the midst of our waiting to see what you're doing and how you'll work. Father, you know we are not patient people. So we ask for the help of your spirit, the help of the community, the love and the compassion and care when we are at fear. And may we experience that when we need it from each other. Help us be that community of faith that now sees even more clearly who you are and because we have experienced Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and the love of God in him in our hearts that we are more free and more empowered by your spirit to live by faith and to love in the midst of an evil, broken world. Give us that power. Lord, as we come to the table today, help us in this table to remind it not only of your present power but also of the future that awaits us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.